Nobody from around that time can now rightly recollect when he first appeared in our quiet little town by the sea. Those of us still left can't even agree if it was spring or fall. Collectively, all we can remember is that one day long ago, we noticed his broken down old camper in the vacant lot by the bluffs. To us, it was a sight that grated like barnacles on raw skin. Back then, our perfect piece of striper coast basically flew under the radar, and we didn't much care for strangers, so the news of his arrival spread like wildfire amongst the local surf fishing community. Most of us were looking to put our kids through college on the money we made from striped bass fishing, so outsiders on our turf were not welcome, same as it ever was on the striper coast during the glory years before the crash in the moratorium. I first heard about him down at Jim's Bait and Tackle. As I walked in that morning for a quick cup of coffee in the latest weigh-ins, Pete the Plumber was railing about how Dave, our local sheriff, should arrest him for vagrancy or whatever code violation he could scratch up. No Johnny-come-lately got the right to stand on our rocks, he proclaimed loudly between sips of his own cup of joe. Clearly I had some catching up to do. Who the hell are you talking about now, I asked as I walked over to where the coffee pot was. Pete looked over at me. Geez, Ray, have you been sleeping through the tides again? I'm talking about that engine just showed up on the town lot up by the bluffs. He ain't been here but three days and already he's squatting on everybody's rock. He don't even seem to sleep. It ain't natural, I tell you. We all knew Pete is a hothead and a bit of an exaggerator, but I just couldn't help myself. Injun, you mean like an American Indian? What are you, deaf as well as stupid, Pete exploded? I said Injun, and a big sucker at that. What do you think I said? I simply couldn't resist. So what, did he have feathers sticking out of his hair? My grin drew a curt reply from Pete. You know, Ray, you can be such an asshole sometimes. Seeing that there was little more reasonable information I could get from Pete, I picked up some leader material and headed home. But if the truth be known, my curiosity had been piqued, and late that afternoon my curiosity got the better of me. So I took a ride down to the bluffs for a look-see of my own. I parked my truck just down the road from his camper, making sure to keep a safe distance so as to not appear nosy. None of us were fishing that day because it was the second day of a strong southeasterly blow and conditions were less than hospitable on the rocks we fished from. Regardless, I casually pulled a rod out of my rack and made false pretense of fishing by loading and unloading my plug bag several times, all the while keeping a weather eye out toward his camper. As it didn't appear that anybody was home, I made my way down the old widow's path to the beach to see if he was crazy enough to be fishing in this mess. Without any preconceived notion as to where he might actually be, I walked west, quartering the wind at my back. During my trek, my attention was mainly focused on traversing the boulder field at my feet, so when I finally got around to looking up, I was surprised to see him standing directly offshore from where I stood. In the fading afternoon light, his figure pierced the raging sea as if made of stone. He stood erect, silhouetted against a mass of white water and a dark, angry sky, seemingly impervious to the elements that railed against him. I stood and watched for several minutes, amazed that any human could withstand the pounding that he was taking. But being a working fisherman, what really caught my attention was where he was standing. Even from my shorebound vantage point, it was clear that he was perched on a rock very far from shore. No one from our clan had ever stood on that one before. As I stood there transfixed by the scene before me, I became aware that his stance had shifted slightly. He was now standing in a position that clearly indicated he was hooked up, and judging by the angle of his back and the bend in his rod, it looked to be a good fish. I watched the battle unfold with the same rapt attention that any real fisherman would have when watching another angler battle a big fish. You just gotta know, plain and simple. After several minutes, my suspicions on the size of the fish were confirmed as he lifted it from the wash to be unhooked. My best guess put it at around 40 pounds, and locally I was known for having a pretty good eye where weight guesstimates were concerned. 
Right about the time my mental scale was done weighing his fish, I was surprised to see that he intended to release it. I had just assumed that he was following the bass for cash, so this was most unexpected. He knelt over the side of the rock with the fish's jaw clamped in his hand and held it face first into the rushing water. Wave after wave broke over his back, but his stance never faltered and his resolve never wavered. When the fish was apparently revived, he released it into the face of the next wave. Then something very strange happened. After releasing the fish, he stood back up and turned to face seaward. He placed his rod between his legs, raised his hands high above his head, and looked skyward. Over the sound of the wind and waves, I thought I heard the sound of singing, but could not be sure. He held this position for several moments, during which time a small crease in the late afternoon clouds let a ray of sunlight shine through, turning the crests of the dark waves the color of liquid gold. The sheer beauty coupled with the surreal nature of the moment was almost overwhelming. After completing his strange ritual and with the rod in his hands again, he turned completely around and looked directly at me as if knowing I was there the whole time. My strange little fugue was suddenly broken by his gaze. Distant though he was, I felt as if he was peering deep inside me, probing, literally touching my insides. It was creepy and like nothing I had ever experienced before. Suddenly I felt as if I had intruded on something very private, and though I did not feel threatened in any way, I had an almost overpowering urge to run. I quickly turned and hastened off the beach. When I arrived back at my truck, I was soaked in sweat and shaking uncontrollably. On the short ride home, my mind struggled to wrap itself around what had just happened. I mean, this is the really real world, isn't it? Shit like this only happens in movies, right? When I arrived home, I let myself in and went straight to the cabinet above the fridge. I pulled down the bottle of vodka I kept there for loosening up my cranky back after those really cold nights and knocked down two quick shots. I was on my third when my wife Janet came through the front door. She was returning from the small hardware store we owned in town as it was her day to close. She walked up, looked me squarely in the eye and said, A little early in the evening for that, don't you think? Then her expression softened. Geez, Ray, you look like crap. Is everything all right? I figured now is not the time to try and explain what had just happened, so I lied. Yeah, I'm okay. I was out scouting some water and I got a nasty chill is all. I'm going to take a hot shower and go to bed. I'm beat. She kissed me on the cheek and went to hang her coat up, but I could tell she didn't buy it for a moment. I didn't really sleep much that night. I just lay there, replaying that afternoon scene over and over in my head. Early in the evening, the wind finally laid down some, and by midnight was coming out of the northwest. Conditions would be fishable by morning, but due to my lack of sleep, I opted to take a pass on the early shift. I reset my alarm clock for 8.30, just enough time to get down to the store to open by 9 a.m., and rolled over on my side. Finally, about the time I would normally be getting up to go fishing, I drifted off into a restless, dream-filled sleep.